Hello there, I'm Lloyd Evans. Welcome to Ramacro. Today I'm going to be looking back at the video content produced by Jehovah's Witnesses in 2022, giving you my 10 worst examples of the organization showcasing hateful, divisive, manipulative, and just downright distasteful ideology. Because I've already covered this material here on the Lloyd Evans channel over the course of the last year, rather than go through it all over again, I'll be counting down from 10 to 1 using clips from previous rebuttal videos. If it makes it easier for you to navigate my list, you'll find timestamps in the description below. I should just mention that narrowing down the content from a whole year to just 10 clips was no easy task and there were a number of truly appalling examples of cultish, vitriolic propaganda that didn't quite make the final cut. But nonetheless, I think it's important to document this material on a year-by-year -year basis so we can remind ourselves of how truly toxic the material spewing from JW.org truly is. Anyway, with all that said, let's roll the first clip. But now, let's discuss three examples of how our fine shepherd tells us one thing, but Satan's underlings or strangers tell us something opposite. We must be vigilant to listen to the right voice. Our fine shepherd tells us as our first example these words at Matthew chapter 24, verses 45 through 47. Who really is the faithful and discreet slave whom his master appointed over his domestics to give them their food at the proper time? Happy is that slave if his master on coming finds him doing so. Truly I say to you, he will appoint him over all his belongings. We know the master Jesus found the faithful and discreet slave spiritually feeding right-hearted ones in 1919 and at a future time will appoint him over all his belongings. So what's the implication? Obviously, even now, Jesus fully trusts the faithful slave. And all of us, even individual members of the governing body, should do the same. But what does the voice of strangers say on this subject? Don't trust the faithful slave. He will mislead you. And who often have the loudest voice promoting this false message? Apostates. Yes, there we have it, the A word. <laughs> it was always going in this direction, wasn't it? So yes, this is the September 2022 JW Broadcasting episode. And Stephen Lett is cutting to the chase here. He is identifying apostates, people like yours truly, who have left the Jehovah's Witness religion as being Satan's underlings, we're agents of Satan, apparently, under his control. Satan, of course, being the great ventriloquist. And what's happening here is Stephen Lett is proceeding with this rant where he says a number of things about former Jehovah's Witnesses or apostates, whatever you want to call them, some of which are true some of which aren't really true. For example, he says, What does the voice of strangers say on this subject? Don't trust the faithful slave. He will mislead you. Now, without wishing to brag, I am fairly well known as an apostate, as a former Jehovah's Witness. In fact, I've been doing this now for over 10 years. My channel's quite well known when it comes to exposing Jehovah's Witnesses and exploring their teachings and policies from a critical perspective. I've never once said, don't trust the faithful slave, he will mislead you. I don't think Stephen Lett 
or the governing body are the faithful slave. That's a claim they're making. It's not a claim I'm making. They're claiming to be God's channel. I'm not saying don't listen to God's channel. Don't listen to God's appointed faithful slave. I cannot say that because I don't believe they are the faithful slave. So what he's doing here is he is straw manning apostates. He is putting words in the mouth of apostates like me. And this is, by definition, deception. We're going to see this actually throughout his rant where he commits the very crimes, for want of a better word, that he's accusing apostates of. A great example is where he quotes from Matthew 24, verses 45 to 47. In fact, if Tibor is gracious, maybe we can read on. Maybe we can get some context here and read to the end of verse 51. Who really is the faithful and discreet slave whom his master appointed over his domestics to give them their food at the proper time? Happy is that slave if his master on coming finds him doing so. Truly I say to you, he will appoint him over all his belongings. But if ever that evil slave says in his heart, my master is delaying, and he starts to beat his fellow slaves and to eat and drink with the confirmed drunkards, the master of that slave will come on a day that he does not expect and in an hour that he does not know, and he will punish him with the greatest severity and will assign him his place with the hypocrites. There is where his weeping and the gnashing of his teeth will be. So what we've done here is we've read the verse in context. Interestingly, you're going to see as Stephen Lett's rant continues, one of the things he's going to bemoan about apostates like me is that we apparently take things out of context. You'll just have to take my word for it. You're going to see evidence of this momentarily but that's one of the things that he criticizes apostates for. Well, what's he done here? He's just cut off the quote. He's just cut off the words of Jesus at a point that is convenient to him and left out the context which calls into question his authority or adds ambiguity to this faithful and discreet slave narrative. Hebrews 13.9 labels false messages as strange teachings. Yes, they are the teachings of strangers. Some examples of their strange teachings are that the faithful slave protects pedophiles, or that slave will exploit you so they can live lives of luxury. Those are both bald-faced lies. Acts 20.30 says that apostates speak twisted things. They do this in order to draw God's sheep away and make them followers of themselves. Something that's twisted is bent out of shape or distorted. Wow, thank you for explaining what twisted means, Stephen. I'm really expanding my vocabulary with this show. They speak twisted things by leaving out vital details, taking things out of context, or in some other way, manipulating a truth into a lie or into a misleading half-truth. 2 Peter 2.3 says, They will greedily exploit you with counterfeit words. A counterfeit is something that's carefully designed to look like the real thing. Seriously, who needs Sesame Street when we've got Stephen giving us all of these definitions? Take, for example, counterfeit money. It might look genuine, but it's fake and thus worthless. If we're deceived into accepting it, 
we'll lose money. But if we're deceived into accepting the counterfeit words of apostates, we'll lose our life. Ah, oh, a death threat. How charming. And apostates will give us absolutely nothing of value in exchange. Can you imagine really needing a loving shepherding visit and asking apostates to give you one? Wow. So much to unpack there. I hardly know where to start. Let's start at the end, shall we, at the words that are still fresh in our minds and work backwards from there. So, Stephen, let's knock out punch when it comes to dismissing apostates as people who shouldn't be listened to as the voice of strangers is that they give us absolutely nothing of value in exchange. We don't need to offer a surrogate set of beliefs, Stephen Lett. We don't need to take your lies and say, hey, we'll give you even better lies. I think ultimately what we have here is an organization in full-on panic mode. The more they jump up and down about apostates, the more they point to the bogeyman under the bed, the more they try to terrify Jehovah's Witnesses when it comes to criticism of the organization and the need to avoid it, the more desperate they show themselves to be. They obviously did it at last year's 2021 convention. In fact, if Tibor is gracious, a thumbnail will appear to a video everything they said about apostates at the 2021 convention. They really went to town at that particular convention with the whole fear-mongering surrounding apostates. And now we see Stephen Lett revisiting this. I, I mean, were Jehovah's Witnesses just not paying attention the first time round? Why the need for the repetition? It was literally the 2021 convention when you were saying all this. And now you're saying it all again. Your criticisms of apostates are frankly what we heard already, only last year. Is this an admission on your part that the sheep, Jehovah's Witnesses, aren't paying attention to you? Are you losing control? That's the feeling I'm getting. But what I really want Jehovah's Witnesses to take home from this particular rebuttal is how shady they are in their fear-mongering and particularly the way they strawman the apostate position and speak with such vagueness when it comes to criticisms against the organization, leaving out, as they say, vital details. If you're going to counter criticism of your organization, discuss the details. Talk about the precise claims regarding child sexual abuse and show how they are bald-faced lies. Stephen Lett isn't going to do that because he can't do that because they're not bald-faced lies. Let's watch a video. Now, here's the setup. For a long time, a sister raised her two children as a single parent, and she did a great job of it. Then she married a very kind brother. The family has a new head. Let's see how well the sister is adapting to her new role. The last few weeks of family worship have been nice, right? Yeah. All these things we ask and pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, this week... We are in chapter 5. Yep, yeah, that's right. And uh, last week, Gabe read, so this week... It's Sue's turn. That's right. It's Sue's turn. Okay, the point here is that when it comes... Honey, maybe an illustration would be better. Um... Okay. It's like a bird. Well, hopefully I was able to clear that up for you a little bit, Olivia. Yeah, thank you. Well, actually, Max, that's not true. 
We had an updated understanding in the recent watchtower. Thanks. I think they went really well. Right? Um, actually. Hey. Maybe we can talk about it later. The sister isn't a bad person. Oh, thanks for clearing that up, David. Or we can ask, what's she teaching her daughter about the wife's role in the family? And what's her son learning about taking the lead as the man of the house? He hasn't had a man in his life for a long time. No, there is one. It's safe to say that the kids will stand a better chance of having a successful marriage themselves when they see their parents pulling together. It's not really about pulling together, though, is it, David Splain? It's about perpetuating and enforcing this outdated, backwards, misogynistic view of family headship. David Splain is obsessed with defining the role of the wife. Irene's problem was that she wouldn't shut up during family worship. She needed to give the floor to her husband. She needed to sit there meekly and humbly and be instructed during family worship rather than having any role in teaching. This is the attitude that Jehovah's Witnesses have towards women. If you're a woman in this religion, you don't get to voice an opinion. You don't get to teach. Leviticus chapter 18 and verse 22 says that homosexual acts are detestable. That is why God gave them over to disgraceful sexual passion. For their females changed the natural use of themselves into one contrary to nature. Likewise, also the males left the natural use of the female and became violently inflamed in their lust toward one another, males with males, working what is obscene and receiving in themselves the full penalty which was due for their error. So, Jehovah has not changed. According to the Creator, homosexual acts constitute disgraceful, obscene error. Homosexual acts are supposedly disgraceful and women speaking in the congregation also disgraceful. What does disgraceful even mean if all it takes to do something disgraceful is open your mouth as a woman in certain situations? I, it's right there, isn't it? It's right there in the Bible. It's right there in the talks that are being given at this convention. This is a messed up religion. And what's most sobering, to coin a Toni Morris word that he always uses, what's most sobering is that it's rooted in the Bible, you know? I really try not to upset Christians who watch the channel because I really appreciate them tuning in and having their beliefs challenged. But how do you excuse this? The Apostle Paul was a misogynist. He wanted women to be quiet. He thought it was disgraceful for them to speak. And it's this sexist, misogynist mindset that is being invoked by David Splain in this talk. David Splain clearly thinks that it's the role of the wife, the role so we're talking gender roles, aren't we really? It's the role of the wife in the Jehovah's Witness religion to shut up on religious matters, to not involve herself in preaching or teaching. And as repulsive as this material is, I mean, imagine how enraging this must be to watch this as a woman. Many of you watching this will be women. 
I mean, my blood would be boiling, it already is. But that's the reality of this religion. So thank you, David Splain, for putting your cards on the table and showing everyone what an awful sexist you are. Hey, want some tea? Sure. Hey, babe. You and me. We're a team, right? Yeah, of course. When I read this, I thought about us. So that they are no longer two, but one flesh. I know before you had to shoulder everything yourself for so long. Mm -hmm. And you did great. You've been raising two beautiful, spiritual kids on your own. But now you have me. Yeah, I do. So do you think sometimes we're not a team? Well, it's just sometimes during family worship. I get excited and I jump in. I know. I'm just so used to doing it after all these years. I know you're not trying to take over. And listen, I love the way you teach. I see how... You can reach the kids in ways that I can't. Just let me guide it. And I'll make sure you can do that. Thanks, honey. Thanks for your patience. No, oh, thank you for your patience. I'm a work in progress, but we make a great team. Why don't we look at what we're going to cover before our next family worship? That sounds great. Wasn't that a fine example of how to attack a problem? Not your mate? That was a fine example of how to tell your wife to shut up without actually saying the words shut up. That's what I took from that part of the dramatization. We're watching David Splain giving the third part of the symposium follow the roadmap to family peace. Apparently, family peace involves women knowing their place. And in this case, the wife, Irene, submitting to her husband's headship and not taking over, not butting in or correcting her husband when he's teaching the family. That's what working as a team is all about. And David Splain's item is work as a team, which is why you saw in the dramatization such an emphasis on we're a team, right? But surely if it were genuinely a team, the person who is most skilled at a given task would be the one who does that task. And what's interesting is in this dramatization, we heard the husband say, I love the way you teach. I see how you can reach the kids in ways that I can't. Just let me guide it. And I'll make sure you can do that. Thanks, honey. Thanks for your patience. Just let me guide it. Just let me be in charge because I am the man. <laughs> you may be better at teaching. You may be able to reach through to the children in ways that I can't. But you're a woman and it's your job to let me guide the family worship. I am the host. I am the one who gets to talk. You have to meekly sit by my side and support me in fulfilling my headship role. It's nauseating, isn't it? Again, this organization is just putting their cards on the table and shouting from the rooftops on only the first day of this convention that this is a sexist, misogynistic group that demeans women. I found it interesting where he said, Why don't we look at what we're going to cover before our next family worship? Why don't we look at what we're going to cover before our next family worship? What's this we business? <laughs> Are you in charge or not? Is this your show or not? If it's really your show, if you're really the head, then 
why do you need to run everything past Irene in advance of the family worship? I think we saw a clue as to why he needs to run things past Irene in the previous instalment. Hopefully I was able to clear that up for you a little bit, Olivia. Yeah, thank you. Well, actually, Max, that's not true. We had an updated understanding in the recent Watchtower. Thanks. Basically, Irene knows her stuff and Max doesn't. Irene is keeping up to date with all of the changes in scriptural understanding with all of the new light. And Max, for whatever reason, is unable to do that. So that's the reason why he needs to run things past Irene in advance of the next family worship. He just doesn't know enough. Irene, again, is the better candidate to be taking the family worship. But purely because of her gender, her religion forbids her from doing that. Of Jesus. Jehovah himself said, This is my son, the beloved, whom I have approved. Listen to him. But in order to do so obediently as Jehovah's sheep, we must reject the voice of strangers. But how would you handle things if the voice of strangers was brought to you by someone close, a friend? or perhaps even a family member. That's what Jade faces in the following dramatization. How will she learn to reject the voice of strangers in a sensitive situation? Smells wonderful. Mm. Oh wait, I forgot. You should cook every night. If you clean every night. Uh, no, we'll take it in turns. Ta-da! But this looks amazing. Mm. Thanks. It's a practice for my first guest. Really? Who? My mum. That's wonderful. We had our first phone call in a year that wasn't a total disaster, so... I invited her around tomorrow. It'll go great. So yes, we have the return of Jade and Nita, the stars of the 2020 Always Rejoice convention, are back with us to help impress the importance of avoiding the voice of strangers, making sure that the only voice we listen to is that of Jehovah's organization or the governing body. That's the purpose here. If I had to guess, this is not the last time we'll be seeing Jade and Nita. I think when we see that intro showing various clips from the Jade and Nita dramatizations, followed by the title screen, that indicates to me that they intend to keep revisiting the Jade and Nita storyline because I think they realize that this is a popular duo. They've managed to find this combination that works well when it comes to the audience finding them believable because let's face it, they're good actors. I think that the whoever it is playing Nita and Jade, I think they're genuinely good actors, which is actually quite rare <laughs> when it comes to Jehovah's Witness dramatizations. Anyway, if you haven't done so already, I would urge you to check out my video on the Jade and Nita saga as presented at the Always Rejoice convention. If T-Boy is gracious, a thumbnail will appear to the story of Jade and Nita 
how to turn someone into a Jehovah's Witness in 14 steps, because that's essentially the purpose of these characters, or at least it was when we first saw them. Jade was a student who was recruited by Nita after Jade saw Nita doing cart witnessing. And there was a series of dramatizations just brazenly showing the methods of manipulation that Jehovah's Witnesses use to recruit people into the group. And usually, thankfully, these methods, these strategies, I think, don't work on thinking adults with developed critical thinking skills. I think that it's quite unusual Unless there is some underlying trauma, some kind of emotional issue that Jehovah's Witnesses can pounce upon and exploit, I think for most people, the beliefs, the ideas are just so ludicrous that no amount of manipulation is going to get someone to fall for them. But in the case of Jade and Nita, because it's all fictional, because they can just make things work, when it's a dramatization, Jade falls for everything. And now we've fast forwarded in the story to where Jade and Nita are now living together, which I think most of us could see coming at some point. <laughs> they do at least have a chaperone who appears to be living with them. So presumably she's keeping them on the straight and narrow. Anyway, Jade talks about her mother and she mentions that she had, or they had, our first phone call in a year that wasn't a total disaster. So I invited her round tomorrow. We saw a glimpse of what phone calls between Jade and her mother looked like during the convention dramatizations. Here's a clip. You listen. Love. The holidays are our time. It's all I get from you. Promise me you'll be here. <laughs> Promise. So that gives us some idea of what Jade meant when she said total disaster. Phone conversations with her mother were a total disaster for a year. Well, that's why. Because the religion she has recently joined drives a wedge between believers and unbelieving family members. It's going to cause friction one way or the other. In this case, the mother simply wanted to see her daughter for Christmas because her daughter was a student. Presumably she's no longer a student because, of course, higher education isn't allowed for Jehovah's Witnesses. Now she's a Jehovah's Witness and she's given up Christmas and she's given up weed. That was another part of the dramatizations. Uh, she'll almost certainly have given up higher education. Goodness knows how an engaged, caring, compassionate concerned mother would react to such huge changes in their daughter. And so when Jade is referring to friction in the phone conversations, quite frankly, that is justified. Now, what we're going to see as this new dramatization progresses, we're going to see Jade's mother, who is bent on trying to retrieve the critical thinking skills of her daughter. Well, how long are you going to be gone for? I'll stay another month. I told my daughter it's too hot here. <laughs> What's happened to me? <laughs> Abigail? Jade girl, how are you? Been better. Oh, Nita said that your mother visited. I hope you don't mind. No. Mum's driving me mad. It's, it's like it's her hobby to ruin my life. Oh. 
She sounds wonderful, like me when my daughter got baptised. You opposed your daughter? Oh, mercy, yes. I love her so much and didn't want to lose her. But I'm not going anywhere. Of course not, but a worried mother doesn't know that. Mother, lunch is ready. I got to go, but I have a scripture for you. When you read it, remember, your mum is not the stranger. John chapter 10 and verse 5. They will by no means follow a stranger, but will flee from him, because they do not know the voice of strangers. Mum is not the stranger. It's what she shares. Reject the voice, not her. Did you look at those links that I sent you? Mum, I want us to get together, but I won't hear anything negative about my beliefs. Well, perhaps we just won't talk religion. It's a deal then? All right then. I can see I'm not going to get anywhere. So what subject do you want to talk about? The deal fell apart fast. Jade, I know we weren't going to talk religion, but I must tell you this one thing that Mom, I read. I thought we weren't going to talk about this. It's getting late. I'm gonna go. <sighs> Thanks for dinner. I'll call you tomorrow. If you're watching this as someone who's never been one of Jehovah's Witnesses, there should be multiple red flags. <laughs> already in this dramatization we've already learned that it would be a terrible thing for a jehovah's witness to look at something that's negative something that isn't slanted in favor of the organization it's okay to read stuff that's slanted in favor of the organization just not the opposite and now we're seeing all of this stuff about the voice of strangers. The part I really want to zone in on is this. They will by no means follow a stranger, but will flee from him because they do not know the voice of strangers. Mum is not the stranger, it's what she shares. Reject the voice, not her. Did you look at those links that I sent you? Mum, I want us to get together, but I won't hear anything negative about my beliefs. Let's start with that last point. Mum, I want us to get together. Do you mean, Jade, Mum, I want us to be able to have a relationship? Notice how they use language in such a clever way. It's clearly not just about whether they're getting together or not. It's clearly not just about the occasional meal. It's about whether Jade's mother is allowed to be in her daughter's life. It's about whether they're allowed to have a relationship or not. But the propaganda twists things. Apparently it's apostates who twist things. It's not the organization who would pull this sort of trick and yet you're seeing it right there in front of you. A relationship between a mother and daughter is merely getting together. 
Mum, I want us to get together, but I won't hear anything negative about my beliefs. So those are the terms that you're expected to accept if you are the mother or father of someone who's just been indoctrinated into the Jehovah's Witness religion. You're supposed to just not talk about the religion if it's anything critical. You're allowed to say positive things. You're allowed to have positive views or ideas about the religion. But you are not, under any circumstances, allowed to show anything negative. How is this not a massive red flag? For anyone who's just objectively looking at this religion, who hasn't yet bought into the indoctrination, all of this will make total sense if you're watching this propaganda as a Jehovah's Witness who's already invested years or decades in this. But how is this going to play to a non-Jehovah's Witness impartial, objective observer. They are shooting themselves in the foot by being so overtly culty. Today, many argue for the acceptance of conduct that Jehovah forbids. They may even find support from a world already alienated from God. But wide acceptance in a growing community does not redefine righteousness. None of that is true righteousness. Our loving creator sets the standard for what is right, not our feelings, not the community at large. In the world, sexual immorality is practiced without shame. Homosexuals flaunt their conduct. But Jehovah tells us that homosexual acts are unrighteous. God specifically warned the Israelites against this and other forms of, of immorality. Leviticus chapter 18 and verse 22 says that homosexual acts are detestable. That is why God gave them over to disgraceful sexual passion. For their females changed the natural use of themselves into one contrary to nature. Likewise, also the males left the natural use of the female and became violently inflamed in their lust toward one another. Males with males, working what is obscene and receiving in themselves the full penalty which was due for their error. So, Jehovah has not changed. According to the Creator, homosexual acts constitute disgraceful, obscene error. Some would disagree. As verse 28 points out, such ones do not consider it worthwhile to acknowledge God. But with what result? As it says there, a disapproved mental state, just the opposite of peace. And merely approving of unrighteous conduct displeases Jehovah. Notice how this is indicated in verse 32. Although these know full well the righteous decree of God that those practicing such things are deserving of death, they not only keep on doing them, but also approve of those practicing them. Still, we do not hate individuals who practice unrighteousness, nor do we judge them. On the contrary, we share the good news with them. We remember that we were all born with the same infirmities and have the same sinful tendencies. But we also have the same inherent spiritual need. And thus we recognize that others can have the same peace, the same privileges, and the same prospects we enjoy if they pay attention to Jehovah. We've been watching governing body helper Budget Shatner, otherwise known as David Schaefer, ranting against the LGBTQ plus community in his talk, The Result of True Righteousness Will Be Peace. This is the final talk of the morning session of the 2022 Pursue Peace Convention. Where do I even begin with this homophobic, bigoted, small-mindedness? 
I do have a few notes in front of me, so I'll work through them. I found it interesting, before we even get into all of the uh, gay bashing and bigoted narrow-mindedness, I did find it interesting when David Schaefer said, But wide acceptance in a growing community does not redefine righteousness. None of that is true righteousness. Our loving creator sets the standard for what is right, not our feelings, not the community at large. So David Schaefer is here making the argument just because something is widely accepted doesn't make it acceptable. He is basically pushing back against what's called the argumentum ad populum, in other words, an appeal to the people or an appeal to consensus, which is a logical fallacy. Now, I'm not aware of people making this argument in support of the LGBTQ plus community. I'm not aware of people saying gay people should be respected because that's the view of the consensus. That's not the argument people are making, as far as I'm aware. The argument they're making is that people should be allowed to live as they choose and love as they choose. And why on earth is it anyone else's business if no one's being hurt or abused? And yet David Schaefer clearly has a problem with this mentality so he is erecting a straw man and suggesting that the LGBTQ plus community and those who support it are making this logical fallacy, this appeal to consensus. Well, I would just draw your attention to a quote from the Knowledge Book, Knowledge That Leads to Everlasting Life, pages 24 and 25. Some scholars suggest that God's name may have been pronounced Yahweh, but they cannot be sure. The English pronunciation Jehovah has been in use for centuries, and its equivalent in many languages is widely accepted today. That is an argumentum ad populum. And there's also a bit of manipulation thrown in for good measure, because when they're making this argument in favour of Jehovah, they say of Yahweh, well, they can't be sure. Well, how can they be sure about Jehovah? No one can be sure how the Tetragrammaton was originally pronounced. Jehovah's Witnesses prefer Jehovah simply because Jehovah is, quote, widely accepted and yet, according to David Schaefer, we can have a different rule when it comes to his straw man interpretation of the LGBTQ plus position. Then he goes on to argue that homosexuality is detestable based on Leviticus 18 verse 22. So let's look up Leviticus 18 verse 22, because apparently we should be living by it, according to Budget Shatner there. Leviticus 18, verse 22. You must not lie down with a male in the same way that you lie down with a woman. It is a detestable act. Let's then scroll down to verse 29. If anyone does any of these detestable things, all those doing them must be cut off from among their people. And when you look at the footnote where it says cut off, says or put to death. So <laughs> what are we supposed to do, David Schaefer? You're telling us that according to this Bible verse, we should view homosexual people as detestable, but the same Bible verse doesn't just say that, it also says that we're supposed to execute people 
who are gay. So is executing gay people something that we should be doing as well? Then David Schaefer doubles down on his vile homophobic rhetoric when he says, Jehovah has not changed. According to the Creator, homosexual acts constitute disgraceful, obscene error. Yes, it's okay to be homophobic, because Jehovah has not changed. When Jehovah decides on something, he never changes his mind. Apart from that time in Jericho. <laughs> Am I the only one who's remembering David Splain's talk at the 151st Gilead graduation, which has only just gone up on the website? Thumbnail to the relevant sushi here, if Tibor is gracious. David Splain devotes an entire chunk of his talk to making the argument that just because Jehovah comes up with a rule doesn't mean he can't make exceptions. This is an organisation that simply cannot help talking out of both sides of its mouth when it suits them to lecture about humility. Apparently Jehovah is all flexible and merciful and not rigid. But then, just a few videos later, Jehovah is rigid when it comes to how people love each other and whether people can have love for and express love for people of the same gender. Shatner then goes on to inform us, oh sorry, I mean Schaefer then goes on to inform us that gay people have a disapproved mental state. Some would disagree. As verse 28 points out, such ones do not consider it worthwhile to acknowledge God. But with what result? As it says there, a disapproved mental state, just the opposite of peace. So if you're gay or if you support gay people or the LGBTQ plus community, it's not just that you're wrong. It's not just that your opinion is incorrect. According to David Schaefer, there's something wrong with your brain. You have a disapproved mental state. This reminds me of the whole furore back in 2011 when The Independent covered the fact that apostates were being labelled as mentally diseased in the organisation's literature. They love to do this, don't they? It's classic narcissistic gaslighting. It's not just, we have this position and we respect that everyone gets to have their opinion, but this is the position we hold. It's everyone who disagrees with us has something wrong in their noggin. They're a bit crazy. That That's gaslighting. That's making people question their judgment and sanity and doing so as a means of manipulation. So thank you, David Schaefer, for just putting your cards on the table and showing what a slimy snake oil salesman you really are becoming or have become, because let's face it, he's been like this for quite a while now. And finally, the, the last thing of many things in this segment that I wanted to draw your attention to was that part where he says, We do not hate individuals who practice unrighteousness, nor do we judge them. On the contrary, we share the good news with them. We remember that we were all born with the same infirmities and have the same sinful tendencies. We were all born with the same infirmities and we have the same sinful tendencies. It's an infirmity now. It's an illness to be gay. You know, imagine how you must feel watching this talk as a young gay or lesbian or bisexual Jehovah's Witness, as I've said before, with your mum and dad either side of you. Imagine being in the living room with this vile speech on the flat screen in front of you and your family around you and being told not just that your feelings are detestable and obscene and disgraceful, not just that you have 
a disapproved mental state, but that you have an infirmity. There is something wrong with you, with who you are, and you need to heal yourself of this infirmity. I really, really do sympathise. I'm glad that of all of the negative experiences I personally had growing up as one of Jehovah's Witnesses, this wasn't an issue for me. I can only imagine how tortured people must feel when they have to walk this tightrope of believing and following this religion, while at the same time knowing how they feel, because Jehovah, in all of his wisdom and mercy, has created gay people and then made it a law that they shouldn't be gay. Laura, our middle child, was perfectly healthy until she turned four years old. That's when she was diagnosed with a rare tumor in her central nervous system. Unfortunately, when the treatment was over, Laura passed away. Even while she was sick, she just loved watching the videos. Her favorite one was Let's Go in Service. This video really made her want to talk about Jehovah. During the time that she was receiving uh, chemotherapy treatments, which lowered her immunity, we couldn't even leave the house with her. But sometimes we'd bring her to get a checkup or get an exam done. And the doctor would say that everything was fine for now, that her immunity was okay. And the very first thing that she'd say to the doctor was, so I can go in the ministry, right? <laughs> and the doctor would laugh and say, sure you can. And our family would take advantage of those times to go in field service together as a family, all together. That made Laura so happy. I have genuinely mixed feelings about this because we're dealing here with the death of a beautiful little girl and Ricardo and Carolina have my deepest and most profound sympathies and condolences. It's the worst nightmare of any parent for this to happen. It's wow. And I feel like I've, I've been through some pretty difficult situations in my life. But one thing that always kind of comforts me is, well, it could be worse. And that's not to invalidate, you know, the pain of, of what you're going through, but just the very, just the very most fleeting thoughts of losing one of my children, it, it's just unthinkable. So for Ricardo and Carolina to go through this tragedy is, well, it's devastating. And again, they have my most profound sympathies. That said, I have to object to the way their story is being used, to the way the memory of their child is being used. I find it disturbing that during Laura's final moments on earth, her final moments of life, the propaganda she was watching in the Become Jehovah's Friend Caleb and Sophia cartoons was making her believe that what she needed to be doing was going out and recruiting people for an organisation. I think there are much better uses of that time than doing that. At least when she was doing that, she was with her family. So I guess you could say, irrespective of exactly what it was she was doing, at least she was surrounded by her family, she was surrounded by loved ones. And that's the most important thing. But I, I just cannot help but feel it leaves a, a bad taste to think that that's how a dying girl was spending her, her final hours or days of mobility 
was going around and working for this organization and helping or trying to help recruit people by manipulating them, by giving them material that is manipulative. So that's, I suppose, all I really have to say on this particular story. I do think that we're seeing a pattern as well of stories like this being used as emotional leverage. As I've repeatedly said on this channel, you can bypass people's need for logic and reason and sound argumentation if you can go right for the emotions. If you can give them a human story that they can relate to, you can effectively f trick someone into thinking, well, you ought to be like that person because they are sticking with the organization despite going through this trial. That's that's the trickery that goes on. And we've seen it done before. Here is an example of an almost identical story being used in this way. Felicity was a bright, vibrant little girl. She was, she was a beautiful kid, she really was. She embraced the fact that she was ill. She was confident and courageous, knowing that Jehovah would resurrect her. Felicity really enjoyed the privilege of being invited to share in the February broadcast of 2016. But sadly, just a few weeks later, Felicity passed away. When you watch a child die in her mother's arms, it's the most saddening thing you'll ever see. The pain and the sting of death is so strong. But after some time, as time goes by, the sting starts to fade a little bit into, I just really miss that person. Felicity often said that she felt the best when she was in the ministry because she didn't focus on her own illness. And since she's died, we can truly understand what she meant by that. So it's almost the exact same story. We have this desperately poorly little girl, a little girl who is dying. And she's been convinced that the way she needs to use her final days is to promote an organization. And as if that weren't bad enough, her memory, Felicity's memory in this case, is used as emotionally manipulative propaganda to keep people trapped in a belief system that is abusive and manipulative. And that's what I find disgusting. I, again, completely empathise with Ben and Veronica in this case and with Ricardo and Carolina. The worst thing that could happen. I just feel as though if they were to ever wake up, if they were to ever realise that they are being lied to and they were manipulated into lying to their children, they may feel very differently about their involvement and participation in this propaganda. Now, as we observed in the video, moral and political issues might be brought up in the workplace. But more often, our young ones, even very young ones, are confronted with these same topics. How will they respond? Are your young ones ready? As you watch the next video, notice how Olivia defends Jehovah's righteous standards. Great discussion today, everyone. Remember, midterms of this Friday, no excuses. That includes you, Jordan. You were noticeably silent during our discussion today, Olivia. I was. I guess I just didn't have much to say. Aren't you concerned about gay rights? Um, well, it seems like a political issue, and, and I stay neutral when it comes to political stuff. But it's not a political issue. This is a human rights issue. Hey, Mr. Dallas, she's like crazy religious. Hey, th there's nothing wrong with that. No, you don't understand. Jehovah's Witnesses hate everybody that isn't straight. That's not true. We don't hate anyone. I've spoken with your people before. 
They seem big on equality. We are. The Bible says God isn't partial, so we believe that everyone should be treated fairly. Good. So I assume you have gay members in your church? Mm, no, we don't. But I thought you just said everyone should be treated equal. I I'm confused. Ah, called it. Jordan, don't you have a class to get to? As I was saying, how is that not a little hypocritical, saying that you love everyone and then excluding certain people? Honestly, Mr. Dallas, I've wondered the same thing. Okay. And? Well, I researched it in the Bible, and I realized that God accepts all people, but he doesn't accept all conduct. What does that mean? It means that you can't be abusing drugs, you can't be stealing or being violent and still be a witness. There's just certain actions that God just doesn't accept. We're watching the latest example of the propaganda crusade that is being waged by Jehovah's Witnesses against the LGBTQ plus community. They are obsessed with making gay people feel isolated, feel abnormal, feel as though there is something wrong with them, feel marginalized. And this video is training young Jehovah's Witnesses on how to project the bigoted, narrow-minded views of the Jehovah's Witness theology in the classroom. Because let's remember, when you are a young Jehovah's Witness, the classroom is your territory. You're even told when you're young, uh, we can't go into your school to preach. We're forbidden from doing so, but you're in there. You're attending classes, so it's effectively your territory. You shouldn't just be treating school as somewhere that you learn stuff. It shouldn't just be about receiving an education. You're going there to educate others. You're going there to even educate your teacher. And that's what we're seeing here. Now, so much <laughs> was standing out for me in this dramatization. I'm going to narrow it down to just a couple of things I wanted to comment on. You'll see the clip where the teacher says, So I assume you have gay members in your church? Mm, no, we don't. No, we don't. We don't have gay members in our church. This was interesting for me. It actually skipped past me the first time I watched it. And then I watched it again just now while filming. And it struck me that what you often hear Jehovah's Witnesses say is that it's okay to be gay. We accept people who are gay you're just not allowed to be a practicing gay. So it's okay to be attracted to members of the same sex, which is what a gay person is, someone who is attracted to the same sex. You're just not allowed to act on it, which is, of course, just ridiculous thinking. Imagine telling a heterosexual person you're allowed to be attracted to the opposite sex. You're just not allowed to act on it. Well, what you're saying is effectively, you're not allowed to be who you are. You're not allowed to love freely and express your love freely to people that you're attracted to. So it's interesting that this propaganda, in addition to schooling young people on how to be unbearable in the classroom, it's also kind of sneaking in a message from the governing body that this isn't an answer that Jehovah's Witnesses should be giving. And while I can't speak for gay people because I don't know what it's like 
to be marginalized as a gay person. I can only imagine this part of the dialogue being so disgusting and so hateful and bigoted in their eyes. It's the part where Olivia says, It means that you can't be abusing drugs, you can't be stealing or being violent and still be a witness. There's just certain actions that God just doesn't accept. Being gay is apparently an action comparable to drugs, taking drugs, stealing, and being violent. If you're gay, you're doing something as bad as all of those things. You might as well be on cocaine. You might as well be beating people up. You might as well be stealing. It's a crime. It's such an abomination that it can be spoken of in the same breath as all of those things. Just as this is supposed to be, let's remember, the model response that's to be given to outsiders. And the teacher is apparently supposed to swallow this. The teacher is supposed to come away thinking, oh, yeah, wow, great point. <laughs> <laughs> being gay, I guess, is a bit like taking drugs or stealing or being violent. There's just certain actions that God just doesn't accept. Including how someone expresses their sexuality? In some cases, yes. We follow God's standards. Not having sex without being married. Well, if that's how you feel, that's your right. Personally, it seems a tad archaic to me, but to each their own. Hey. hey. Does the Bible really say all that? Yeah, it does. Okay. Maybe you could show me sometime. Yeah, for sure. Awesome. So we can expect future installments in this saga. Oh, goody. Let's hope they're as entertaining as what we've just seen. Again, where do we even start? Well, I think what we have here, as I've already mentioned about previous installments in this saga featuring Olivia, Gabe, and what's the name of the mum, Irene, as I've mentioned already, what we have here is evidence that the writers are not living in reality. So <laughs> they've spent so long in this sheltered Jehovah's Witness bubble, especially the bubble of Bethel, that they don't know how real life works. They think that the arguments that they're giving in these videos, including the one we saw previously where Irene is confronted in the workplace, they think these are good answers to give, including conflating homosexuality with violence, drugs and stealing. And they think that this is such a good answer that it's going to prompt a schoolmate who's listening in to walk up and say, hey, does the Bible really say all that? You know, I'm really digging this message of gay people being akin to drug addicts and thieves and violent people. That's sort of in line with what I think. <laughs> I'm really attracted to the idea of of learning more about how wrong being gay is and how we should anticipate the imminent destruction of all gay people. Yeah, that's, that's really going to happen. But did you notice how Olivia was able to defend Jehovah's Righteous Standards? 
She kept her peaceful spirit, didn't she? She acknowledged that she had the same question as the teacher, but she had done further research on the subject. And did you appreciate how she subtly showed that Jehovah's standards benefit both the individual and the community? As examples, she highlighted the avoidance of drug abuse and theft, values she knew her teacher would appreciate. Parents, are your young ones able to explain why we do or don't do certain things? Do you know how your children really feel about Jehovah's standards? Are they obedient simply to avoid making you mad? If so, will that truly be enough? Encourage your young ones to prove to themselves why Jehovah's standards are wise. Help them to see how they can explain their choice to live by Jehovah's standards. Teach them how to resist pressure to follow the world. In case you've been wondering why I call David Schaefer Budget Shatner, well, here's a perfect example. Are your young ones able to explain why we do or don't do certain things? What we've essentially had here is reminding parents of the need to indoctrinate their children to have these hateful, bigoted views. Not just have them, but promote them in the school classroom, shove them down the throats of anyone who will indulge them or question them. We've also had him single out for praise an incredibly disingenuous response to the question, why is it such a problem for someone to be gay? And did you appreciate how she subtly showed that Jehovah's standards benefit both the individual and the community? As examples, she highlighted the avoidance of drug abuse and theft, values she knew her teacher would appreciate. It benefits the community for someone to not be gay. <laughs> Sound, just saying that sounds bonkers, doesn't it? It benefits the community for someone to not be attracted to the same sex in just the same way as it benefits the community for someone to not take drugs, not be violent, and not steal. And this is apparently a great argument, such a great argument, that it is the approved response in this situation, a response that's given praise here by David Schaefer. Remember Jeremiah 17 and verse 9. Simple expression, but so true. Jeremiah chapter 17 and verse 9. It says, The heart is more treacherous than anything else and is desperate. Who can know it? The heart is treacherous. We might allow our emotions to get the better of us. For example, when a family member is disfellowshipped. If the person is living outside the home, we know that we should limit our association to necessary family business. Now, if the family was never very close, that might not be a problem. But suppose family ties are really strong. That can be a challenge. If we allow ourselves to be ruled by emotion rather than by scriptural principles, we could stretch the meaning of necessary family business to include almost any activity. The heart is treacherous. Yes, he really went there. He had to stick the boot in. For those of us who are being shunned, myself included, because we dared to disagree with the governing body, with David Splain and his mates, he had to read that scripture in Jeremiah and suggest that it would be treacherous for Jehovah's Witnesses to show some humanity to acknowledge the existence of their disfellowshipped sons, daughters, brothers, sisters, fathers, mothers. What a cold man he is. Actually, I'm thinking of words 
to describe him that I probably shouldn't say on YouTube. But this is a vile man. He didn't need to say any of this. It was already a terrible talk. It was already a talk that showcases how culty and controlling this organization is. But he just had to go there. He just had to make life that little bit more miserable for Jehovah's Witnesses who are disfellowshipped or who are otherwise being shunned by believing Jehovah's Witness family members. Make no mistake, these words, just that brief clip, just over a minute, will have an impact on relationships. There will be ex-Jehovah's Witnesses who, up to this convention, were finally having a dialogue with their believing Jehovah's Witness family members and getting on fine. And neither side necessarily trying to influence the other, both sides respecting that there was an ideological difference when it comes to religion, but just being there for each other in the most basic sense, just being a mother to a son or daughter, just being a son or daughter to a mother or father, just being human. And then after this convention, after these words are spoken by David Splain, the wall will come down again. The relationship will once again be decimated. And let's remember the context here. This is an organization that brags about pursuing peace. Peace, not just in terms of conflict and war, but peace within the family. Oh, we're all about peace within the family, apart from when someone's disfellowshipped, in which case it would be treachery to show some basic humanity and not treat someone who's stopped being a Jehovah's Witness as though they're dead. In this episode of My Teen Life, we'll hear from two young people who successfully resisted the temptations to have sex. How do they do it? Well, every day in high school, my classmates would talk about sex. They would just talk about, you know, their boyfriends and girlfriends, what they did with them, you know, over the weekend, what they're going to do. They, of course, knew that I was one of Jehovah's Witnesses and that I wouldn't engage in premarital sex, uh, but that did not stop them from pushing. Guys would invade my personal space. Sometimes they would even try to, you know, grab or touch me. One day, uh, a girl in class, she asked me to touch her inappropriately. Of course, I rejected her, but she even started, resorted to calling me names. Uh, she called me lame, and she said that I must be gay. It seemed to be a game to them to try to break me and try to get me to do things with them. But the fact that I wouldn't give in, um, they thought it was fun or funny. Uh, it got to the point where this became very physical. I had two classmates behind me that were pushing me, uh, one classmate on each side of me, grabbing my arms and pushing me, trying to make me touch her. Um, and I knew that it was time to get out of there. We're watching the October 2022 episode of JW Broadcasting, and it's time for another installment of My Teen Life, the show that sort of mimics YouTuber vlogs. Essentially, we're seeing young Jehovah's Witnesses pretending to speak candidly when so obviously what they're saying is either scripted or what they're expected to say by the people behind the camera. The biggest problem I have so far is that this particular episode, episode six, has the theme, how can I fight the pressure to have premarital sex? What's been described doesn't seem to fit this particular question. Guys would invade my personal space. Sometimes they would even try to you know, grab or touch me. That's not pressure to have premarital sex. That's sexual harassment. If the episode were titled, 
how can I deal with sexual harassment? That would be an appropriate story to tell. But how do you file this scenario under pressure to have premarital sex? If someone is experiencing sexual harassment, they need to be involving the authorities. In this case, they should be going straight to the principal's office and saying, this person in my class was invading my personal space and trying to grab or touch me. It's a serious matter. And yet, according to Jehovah's Witnesses, this is something where it's a religious thing. This is a situation where Bible verses need to be wheeled in. It's all about being a good person. You can deal with these scenarios where you're being sexually harassed, so long as you're a good enough Christian. Shortly before this incident, my grandmother actually prepared me. Uh, she would prepare Watchtower articles for me um, that talked about how to deal with temptation. Although those talks with her were super duper awkward, um, if I'm being honest, they really helped me to stay spiritually strong and to resist the temptation. My parents always told me to use far-sighted wisdom. Think about how that action would affect me in the future, affect my relationship with Jehovah, with my friends and my family. Um, that definitely went through my head a lot during that time. All you need to do is trust in Jehovah because if you trust in Him, then everything is going to be okay. Where do we even begin on this? I'm not even as incensed as I thought I would be about the whole sexual repression aspect of this, which is actually quite triggering as someone who's been raised in an organization that says you're not allowed to masturbate, you're not allowed to have sex before marriage, you're not allowed to be gay. You're not allowed to marry someone who isn't a Jehovah's Witness. You're not allowed to look at porn. All of these restrictions that change who you are as a person, that stifle a profound part of your psyche, this sexual repression is rampant in this particular episode of my teen life. But what infuriates me more than anything is that they have referred to at least one clear example of sexual harassment where a girl has had her personal space invaded and people trying to grab or someone trying to grab or touch her there's no advice whatsoever to go to the authorities, to go to the school authorities or the police. Instead, somehow it's all about her. Somehow it's all about her being a better person. And what really incensed me was this part. My parents always told me to use far-sighted wisdom. Think about how that action would affect me in the future, affect my relationship with Jehovah, with my friends and my family. Um, that definitely went through my head a lot during that time. I'm not surprised it went through your head a lot, love. What you're describing is the fear of shunning. We're talking about, again, sexual harassment, and apparently what this girl most urgently needs to think about is what the ramifications would be if there were any actions that would result in a loss of her relationship with Jehovah, with my friends and family. And flashing up on the screen, you see again that verse from Proverbs 22 verse 3, which actually was used in only the last installment of my teen life. Apparently, we can just bring this verse out for almost any episode. It just fits for almost any problem 
the shrewd one sees the danger and conceals himself. That's the advice, apparently, for someone in a sexual harassment situation. Have you been shrewd? Have you seen the danger? Have you concealed yourself? Have you tried to hide somewhere? Have you checked out all the possible nooks and crannies where you could cower so that you don't get sexually harassed? Maybe I'm reading too much into things, but that's the message I'm receiving here. It's one thing to say no to premarital sex, which is the theme, apparently, of this instalment of my teen life. How can I fight the pressure to have premarital sex? It's one thing to take a position on whether you want to have sex before marriage or not. It's another thing entirely if we're talking about sexual harassment, if we're talking about individuals forcing themselves on other individuals in a sexual way, and the advice that's given in this episode is absolutely disgraceful. If you're watching this as one of Jehovah's Witnesses, how can you defend this? An entire generation of Jehovah's Witness teens are here being told if you get sexually harassed at school, somehow it's your fault, somehow you need to figure out a way of concealing yourself and be careful just in case you end up doing something that could cause you to be shunned. Now the program is going to feature a number of videos interspersed with uh, talks from various members of the governing body. I don't know what they're going to talk about, but they certainly have chosen some interesting themes. I'm going to be on the edge of my seat to see what they have to tell us. But first up is a video on one of our favorite subjects, Caleb and Sophia. Now, just so you know, Caleb is not a member of the governing body, but <laughs> he's, he's going to be on the program anyway. Now, this is the longer version. They call it the epic version. It's part of the series uh, Become Jehovah's Friend. And the title is, Who Should Be My Friend? Let's watch. You got this. Come on. Go, go, go. Yes. Bro, that was good. <laughs> So we're only 50 seconds into the latest installment in the Caleb and Sophia saga, this being Lesson 47, Who Should Be My Friend? 50 seconds in, and I'm already triggered <laughs> as an ex-Jehovah's Witness, as someone who grew up in the Jehovah's Witness religion. I've repeatedly commented on the fact that when you're a Jehovah's Witness child, school somehow isn't just for learning. It's not just about going to school and receiving an education. You go to school at least partly with the objective of recruiting your classmates. We don't see that in the opening 50 seconds, but what we do see, maybe Tibor can overlay if he's feeling gracious, we do see Sophia in the playground reading a Jehovah's Witness publication while her friends around her are playing. So if you're watching this 
as a Jehovah's Witness child, the message you're getting is, oh, I need to be reading Jehovah's Witness publications when I'm at school, when people around me are playing. I can't just enjoy myself with my school friends. I can't just use the break period to have a break from learning to just relax and unwind and laugh and play. I've got to somehow use this time to indoctrinate myself using Jehovah's Witness publications. That's the message you're getting as a child that's the message parents are getting so that they'll be making sure children go to school with JW publications in their book bag to read during lunch break or whenever. I'm also curious as to this scene where Sophia is alone on the school bus and noticing her friends being picked up rather than being required to take the school bus. Maybe t can again overlay. That's a bit of an odd scene. I don't quite understand what's being depicted here. Is this suggesting that if you're a good Jehovah's Witness, you'll take the school bus rather than be picked up? It's almost suggesting that it would be molly coddling or being overly indulgent of children if they were to be picked up by their parents it's almost suggesting that children should be put to work <laughs> which has been the message in the past thumbnail here to a talk by david splain on the need for child labor <laughs> the governing body just seems to think that children should be putting in a shift Wait, 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 wait. Let me get this straight. He wanted you and Mary to sit and learn about God just like the men? The teacher instructing women, a woman's job is to provide food for her household. That's true. A good woman prepares herself for hard work. That's valuable. That's you, Martha. Don't let this Jesus ruin you with his ideas. doing? Not well. I sent word to Jesus. He will help my brother. You sent word to Jesus? Have you still not heard? He's angering people with his shocking speech. He's claiming to be God's son. He's crazy. He's he loyal to Jehovah, and he is our friend. Sadly, Lazarus died. But do you remember what happened next? Jesus came back to Bethany and resurrected Lazarus. Jesus was a real friend. He cared about Martha, Mary, and Lazarus. And he showed them what kind of friend Jehovah can be to us. But that's not where the story ends. Do you know what some people did after that? Many of the Jews who saw what he did put faith in him. 
But some of them went off to the Pharisees and told them what Jesus had done? Why did they do that? Because not even seeing Jesus bring someone back to life was enough to convince them that he was the Christ. Okay, there are a couple of things I want to talk about here. The first being a scene which seems to portray Jesus as being progressive when it comes to the role of women in society. He wanted you and Mary to sit and learn about God just like the men. The teacher instructing women, a woman's job is to provide food for her household. That's true. A good woman prepares herself for hard work. What's happening here, I think, is actually quite subtle and clever. Ultimately, it amounts to managing expectations of women in the Jehovah's Witness organization. So imagine three levels. The top level being parity with men, where you get to teach. The middle level or second level being being able to be taught by men. And the bottom level or level one being you're just there to provide food if you're a woman. So imagine these three levels. And really all women should be on level three. There's no reason, is there, why women shouldn't be just as involved in teaching as men are. We should be seeing way more of women when it comes to all walks of life, including matters of belief and religion and that sort of thing. But Jehovah's Witnesses clearly don't believe that. They subscribe to the view of Paul, who said, let the women be silent in the congregation. And what they're doing here is they are trying to reframe the Mary and Martha story as told in Luke chapter 10 as being an example of Jesus being progressive and giving more empowerment to women. But what actually happened in the conversation that's just skimmed past, we don't even hear the words of Jesus, well, if Tibor is gracious, we can look up Luke chapter 10 and read verses 40 to 42. Martha, on the other hand, was distracted with attending to many duties. So she came to him and said, Lord, does it not matter to you that my sister has left me alone to attend to things? Tell her to come and help me. In answer, the Lord said to her, I'll help you, what needs doing? <laughs> that would have been impressive. If he, imagine if he had said that. They seemed like Martha's friends, but they hated Jesus. How do you think Martha dealt with her unbelieving friends? Jesus is the Christ, the resurrection and the life. He is the Son of God, and He is my friend. Talia, you've been kind to me in the past, but you don't believe Jesus' teachings. We cannot be friends. Martha stuck with Jesus and his friends. They helped her become Jehovah's friend. So, Sophia, what do you think Jehovah is teaching you about friendship? That I have to choose my friends carefully. And how can you know if someone should be your friend? If they help me be Jehovah's friend, I am not going to join the club. That's my girl. We are so proud of you, Sophia. And Jehovah is proud of you, too. Now, how about you go finish up your homework? Mom tells me we have a guest coming over. 
Okay. Jehovah, please help me find a good friend. Someone who loves you. At least you are my friend. Sophia! Lydia is here. Our talk! <laughs> <laughs> You like turtles? I love turtles. Really? I've got something I want to show you. He is so cute. You know, Sophia, I think we're going to be friends. Yep, definitely friends. Admit it, you enjoy watching Caleb and Sophia just as much as the kids do. <laughs> and we know that because we get letters. Oh, I know you get letters, David. I also know that you're extremely selective in which letters you take seriously. We might mention that we've had just a few parents write in expressing concern that some of our videos depict scenes that could have an effect on children who've been protected from anything even hinting at an act of violence. We very much appreciate the concern. However, when portraying a Bible account, we cannot ignore the message Jehovah saw fit to preserve in His Word. We don't feel comfortable watering down the inspired insight that Jehovah has preserved for the benefit of true worshipers. So when it's a letter praising the governing body for their Caleb and Sophia videos, when it's a letter telling the governing body that they've done a splendid job and that the Caleb and Sophia videos are enjoyed even by adults, those are letters that they can take seriously. Those are letters that give them knowledge about their audience. But if it's a letter from a parent complaining about violence and gore in convention dramatizations, then, well, we think we know better, actually, than the parents. That's the message I'm getting. And no, I'm sorry, David Splain, I do not enjoy the Caleb and Sophia cartoons. This one is a perfect example of the manipulation. I mean, just think about it. It's one thing to manipulate adults, as we see in, for example, the Jade and Nita dramatizations. You know, using all the tools that cults commonly use to control people's thinking and behavior and emotions, wielding those dark arts on adults is one thing. But when you start manipulating kids, doesn't that say something about how low you're willing to sink? I was pretty happy. Um... But I already was starting to feel the effects of my cancer. We just didn't know what it was, really. One day, I, I was okay, and then the next day, I started feeling bad, you know? Once we moved to New York for my treatment, I no longer had that big family bond anymore. What I was feeling back then in New York was just sadness. Never really peace. My baptism day was very exciting. The spiritual family I inherited was very vast. The day I met Marissa was at a convention. She's a really great 
friend, a spiritual friend. When she takes me to my hospital appointments, we would eat out. When they told me about my cancer being gone, I was really happy, I was ecstatic. I was like, finally, I'm gonna get to do normal things that a uh, kid my age should be able to do. I don't need to be afraid or anxious anymore. Unfortunately, I did relapse again. And uh, basically right now, my present condition is there's nothing really more to do. They're just waiting to let nature take its course, basically. Um, and that's it. In harmony with Ephesians chapter four, verse 26, I had to let myself process the news and let myself be sad, angry. Um, let yourself feel those feelings. Do not try to repress them, but you can control your thoughts and your actions. We've been watching parts of a video segment shown to Jehovah's Witnesses on the Saturday morning of their 2022 Pursue Peace convention. The theme of this section of the convention is how our brothers are enjoying peace despite opposition, illness, economic problems, natural disasters. What a brave young woman who is faced with death, it seems. So her condition is terminal. She had cancer, the cancer went into remission, then, then there was a relapse, and she's now been told that it's just a matter of letting nature take its course. In other words, this girl is dying. Jehovah's Witnesses have form for this sort of propaganda. I've actually done a sushi on this already. Sushi 289. And it's from the April 2022 JW Broadcasting episode. Thumbnail here if Tibor is gracious. And in this sushi, I talk about the fact that Jehovah's Witnesses use the deaths of children as emotional manipulation, as propaganda. Death happens at some point to everyone including children, irrespective of what religion you're in. But the message Jehovah's Witnesses want you to take from this is that dying or being gravely ill is only manageable if you get the peace of being a Jehovah's Witness. The organisation is adding insult to injury by not only exploiting this girl's terminal illness for emotional propaganda purposes, I strongly suspect they are also putting words in her mouth. Pretty much my whole life, uh, it has revolved around my illness, but I learned how to shift focus. I just don't focus on myself all the time. I focus on others, their trials, that are different, but just as hard. You read the stories on JW.org in the newsroom. The Russian brothers and sisters, I, I, I pray for them constantly because um, they're going through a very tough time. If you focus on yourself, your pain gets worse. When you focus on others and on their problems, your pain lessens, diminishes. Hello. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> Antoinette, uh, I was so, when I was told that we would talk with each other, this was something very special for me. Uh, same for me too. Uh, when uh, the brothers told me as well uh, about meeting you, I was really excited. Thank you for your prayers on behalf of the brothers in Russia. They are precious. We can learn so much from you. When I heard that you were praying for us and for the brothers and sisters in Russia, 
it really encouraged me and Felix. It's such an example for me personally. We mentioned it in our prayer yesterday. Felix was saying that you are a great example of how we need to genuinely care for our brothers and sisters. We love you very much. <laughs> Bye bye. Hey, good night meeting you. <laughs> bye bye. <laughs> bye. My cancer is uncurable, but um, I know the cure is in the new system, so <laughs> that's the cure. <laughs> I like to imagine when that time happens, what will I be doing? Obviously, I'm gonna be jumping for joy because I'm gonna be rid of my cancer. I'm gonna enjoy food that we never really got to enjoy. And I'm gonna have so many animals. I'm gonna make a house. I'm gonna learn how to make a house. Um, <laughs> Peace in this world is not the absence of illness, danger, persecution, or economic problems. Peace in this world is listening to Jehovah's guidance, praying to Jehovah constantly, meditating on Jehovah's word and his promises. If you're anything like me, you are boiling with rage at this point. How dare they? How dare they take this young girl who is dying of cancer and use her as a puppet for their nonsense, for their grotesque theology about billions dying so that the planet can be terraformed and only Jehovah's Witnesses live on it? How dare they? Rather than just talking about herself, she's got to do this segue, apparently, where she says, of course, when you're in my situation, it helps if you think about other people. And then you switch to Felix quoting Acts 20 verse 35. There is more happiness in giving than in receiving. It's just a blatant hijacking, in my opinion, of the emotional weight of Antoinette's story and using Antoinette and using her horrendous situation to piggyback on this persecution narrative that Jehovah's Witnesses or the Jehovah's Witness leadership are clearly obsessed with. I've called it many times persecution porn. They absolutely crave examples of Jehovah's Witnesses being persecuted so that they can make all Jehovah's Witnesses feel persecuted and make all Jehovah's Witnesses feel as though theirs must be God's one and only true religion because which other group is being persecuted like we are? Only it turns out there are other groups that are being persecuted to a far more savage and brutal degree right now. Frankly, how dare they do this? How dare they take a young woman's suffering and imminent death and use that as an opportunity to talk about how persecuted and oppressed the organisation is and try to draw parallels between her dying soon and someone being unfairly imprisoned. So that's it. We've come to the end of my worst Jehovah's Witness videos of 2022. But now I want to know your thoughts. Which clips in your view should have been higher or lower in the list? And which videos can you remember from 2022 that should have been included but weren't? please let me know in the comments below. In the meantime, I hope you found this video helpful. Thank you so much for watching.